Hello and welcome to the History Hour podcast from the BBC World Service with me, Max Pearson. The past brought to life by those who were there. This week, a Russia which disappeared forever, captured in rare colour photos. At that time, you have to realise that the only photograph in colour were taken indoor, in labs. And he was probably the first to do a lot of work outside. Also, the man who was wrongly identified as the patient zero of AIDS. Every weekend was uh, party time and your sole objective was to get laid, hopefully by someone different. If you weren't doing that, you weren't living up to your uh, responsibilities as a partying gay person. And a first-hand account of the kinder transports as Jews escaped Nazi-occupied Prague. And I can still see in my mind's eye my mother standing there looking anxiously on the platform and I was in the window of the carriage and a German soldier with a swastika on his arm standing nearby. That's all to come. But we're going to begin this week in Russia where this year marks the centenary of events which truly did change the world. Claims like that can all too often be overblown, but in this case it's just a fact. 1917 saw a series of upheavals which resulted in the rise of communism and the birth of the Soviet Union. That in turn divided the world into two blocks, leading to wars in many countries as rival ideologies clashed. But the germ of all that can be traced back to rising civil unrest in Tsarist Russia, which led in March 1917 to the abdication of Tsar Nicholas II at the height of the first Russian revolution of that year. Alex Last has been gathering eyewitness accounts from the BBC archives. The Russian Revolution came as a thief in the night. We felt it was coming, but had no idea when. Suddenly it was there. In March 1917, violence and protest erupted in the Russian capital Petrograd, now called St. Petersburg. After centuries of autocratic rule, Russia was in the grip of revolution, as remembered by British and exiled Russian eyewitnesses who spoke to the BBC. People went singing songs and a lot of shouts were, this is the first bloodless revolution. We're having no bloodshed, no bloodshed. But by the next day, a lot of the policemen were being murdered and burned to death and one heard their screams and shouts. It was a realisation of uh, all desire, all dreams. It was a reconstruction of Russia as a free democracy based on all human rights and uh, social justice. The events of March 1917 had been brewing for years. Nicholas II became Tsar in 1894 as part of the Romanov dynasty who'd ruled Russia for 300 years. He was a short man. He always wore a simple Russian uniform and in face he looked exactly like King George V. They were first cousins and... uh, The family resemblance was extremely strong. There was a brilliant season, a great many balls and parties, and it was said that a train used to arrive every day with flowers from Nice for the decoration of the rooms. But the reality of life for most Russians was far removed from the lavish life at court. The poverty that I saw among the working classes just outside St Petersburg at the mills and works with which my father was connected was really pathetic. And Nicholas II was not a stranger to crisis. In 1905, troops had opened fire on a huge crowd of workers who'd come to the Tsar's palace in a peaceful demonstration. In the aftermath, as protests escalated, the Tsar was forced to agree to reforms, including the creation of a kind of parliament, the Duma, but the Tsar soon deprived it of any authority and resisted calls for change. But then, in 1914, came the First World War. (laughs) Russia's corrupt, ineffective administration could not cope. Its army, poorly equipped, badly led, suffered terribly. Facing the armies of Germany, Austro-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire... Russia lost millions of men. The Tsar, who'd taken command of the armies himself, could not escape blame. 
despite the fact that I knew him personally and I felt a warm feeling of affection for him. I did not consider him a strong and powerful enough man to head a large country like Russia, and especially during the war. Among many Russians, there was suspicion of the Tsar's German-born wife, the Tsarina Alexandra, and anger at the growing power of the dissolute royal favourite, the mystic Rasputin, who'd gained huge power at court through his supposed ability to heal the sickly heir to the throne. And as the country was battered and drained by war, at home, Russia was struggling with shortages and inflation. The atmosphere was a very depressing one, yet a very exciting one. There was defeat on all fronts. Large convoys of wounded people were coming in, and the atmosphere amongst the soldiers was very depressed. They were talking of, of defeat, talking of treason, talking of the fact they had no guns, no ammunition, largely due, as the soldiers said, to the fact that the high command was corrupt, that the Tsar was obviously in league with the enemies, and the Tsarina, who was a German, was suspected of complicity. And in March 1917, in St. Petersburg, now called Petrograd, huge workers' protests began again. There were riots and disorder in the streets. People were smashing up shops, looting bread shops, tram cars were being overturned, barricades were being built. Out of the bread riot grew one strike and then another until the people began to feel their power. There was a great deal of fighting. Red flags were now to be seen everywhere. The soldiers tied strips of red to their bayonets. The civilians wore red armlets or streamers from their buttonholes. The police were armed with machine guns. Machine guns had also been placed on the Duma building and even on the churches and on St Isaac's Cathedral. Troops sent to disperse the crowds fraternised with the people. On March 11, the crowds were masters of the capital and were enjoying themselves by arresting frightened ministers and releasing prisoners. The Tsar's authority was in tatters. Criticised on all sides, he felt he could not go on. And finally, he took the momentous decision to abdicate. We, Nicholas, by the grace of God, Emperor of all the Russias, King of Poland, Archduke of Finland, to all our faithful subjects, in agreement with the Imperial Duma, we have thought good to abdicate the crown and lay down the supreme power. Above all, it was a hopeful revolution. Everyone not only wanted a change, but believed a new era was dawning, an era in which all would be free. But some royalists felt the Tsar's abdication was an act of betrayal. Hearing that news, every single man, officers and soldiers, wept. An old grey-haired colonel said in tears, the Tsar has abandoned us. As a replacement to autocratic Tsarist rule, the Duma set up a provisional government in Petrograd, would eventually be led by a socialist deputy, Alexander Kerensky. But in reality, it had to share power with the city's newly formed and more radical left-wing council of workers and soldiers called the Petrograd Soviet. The provisional government pledged to continue the war, but Russia's huge problems remained and the revolution began to swing dramatically to the left. Food supplies were failing, transport had broken down, the army was melting away. What I now saw in Russia was an attempt to establish a central government which was not autocratic but democratic. It failed not because heroic efforts were not made by Kerensky and his colleagues. Chaos supervened and to end it autocracy came again. But this time under the aegis of a group of socialist intellectuals most of whom had been living in exile, who were called Bolshevik. Still many moderates hoped Russia would become a liberal democracy. But some revolutionaries, like Lenin and Trotsky, had other plans. And the Russian Revolution was far from over. <laughs> 
Alex Last with those voices from the archives. And we'll return to the first and then the second Russian revolutions in a moment. But before we do, we're going to pay our respects to a man who helped to bring to life for all subsequent generations what it was like in Russia during those years before the upheavals of 1917. He is the groundbreaking photographer Sergei prokudin Gorsky, who was encouraged by the Tsar to travel the length and breadth of the Russian Empire, taking colour pictures of people from all walks of life. His work is remarkable, and I'll tell you how you can see it for yourself in a moment. But first, Dina Newman has been speaking to his grandson, Michel Susseline. My grandfather, Sergei Mikhailovich Prokudingorsky, was one of the pioneers of color photography. At that time, you have to realize that the only photographs in color were taken indoor, in labs. And he was probably the first to do a lot of work outside. The Russian landscapes, churches and portraits captured by Sergei Prokudingorsky are stunning. Michel Sosalin, the photographer's grandson, says these images bring back the world which vanished after the Russian Revolution. There's a boatman wearing an imperial uniform and a cap. He has one arm. Perhaps he is one of the veterans of the Russian-Japanese War. This is um, a very nice picture on the Marinsky Canal, where he has done a lot of shots. You really feel something extremely, I would say, natural. Uh, you can really feel that this guy was very so pleased probably to be taken. In the years leading up to 1917, Sergei Prokudingorsky worked on a huge project, travelling to some of the most remote parts of the Russian Empire, taking photographs of people and places which would otherwise remain unknown to the elite in St. Petersburg. The idea of my grandfather was to be able to see the, the different aspect of this huge country, the different people. My grandfather was extremely open mind He was really a Renaissance man, and he was not so interested to take the high aristocracy who was trying to get the dresses from Paris, so he was more attracted to small workers uh, in small towns, small village. There's a portrait of three young women from a remote village in northern Russia, wearing their Sunday best in long, intricately embroidered dresses. They hold plates with berries as if to welcome us to their home. Behind them is an izba, a traditional Russian house made of wood. The quality of the color is extraordinary. If you zoom in, you can see the makeup on the girls' faces, probably made from beetroot juice. Prakudingorsky invented his own technique to make color images. They were originally produced as slides, Looking at his lab books, we can get a glimpse into his unique method, which relied to a great degree on his expertise as a chemist. These two lab books describe several uh, techniques. You can see that he was uh, taking same pictures with different type of filters or different type of uh, chemical gelatin. I mean, it's extraordinary, this tight writing in Russian yes, and, and a lot of work. Here is a drawing. You have a drawing of some part of the camera, probably some of his remark about the filter set. You have a lot of formula, of course. The chemicals are so important because he creates three slides. All of them look grey but they contain some chemicals. And when they are superimposed on each other with color filters, then the magic happens right. and it turns into sure. vibrant color. If you start from gray and you go through a filter, you achieve a color image on your screen. The crucial point in Prokudingorsky's career as a photographer came in 1909, when he was invited to show his slides to the Tsar in the private royal residence at Tsarske Silo. It was a quite limited number of uh, slides, landscape, some people or some monument, some churches, and he had done a very clever selection 
to show a little bit of everything to the Tsar. And this is where I think he was clever enough. He didn't speak about money. He was just saying that his goal was really to create a kind of big catalogue of uh, what is the empire. The slideshow was a success. The Tsar was so impressed that he gave Prakosin Gorsky a railway carriage to use as a darkroom and permission to travel anywhere in the Russian Empire, including the Caucasus and Turkestan, present-day Central Asia. His most famous photo from Central Asia is the portrait of the last emir of Bukhara. Bukhara was a Russian protectorate, and its ruler, Emir Alim Khan, had studied in St. Petersburg and was interested in modern scientific developments. Emir Alim Khan is photographed seated outside his palace in a splendid blue silk robe and a turban. Today, these unique photos can be seen on the website of the Library of the U.S. Congress. But not all slides are catalogued there. Some remain in Michelle's private possession. So here is a slide of the son of the Tsar, Tsarevich Alexei. I think he looks very serious, a little bit tense. Uh, he was a very fragile child. It was, uh, it, it was the drama of the family because he had a hemophilia. And uh, as soon as he hurt somewhere, it became a nightmare because he was bleeding and so Eleven years after that photo was taken, Tsarevich Alexei and his family were shot dead by the Bolsheviks who had come to power after the revolution in 1917. Prakuzin Gorsky's eldest son, Dmitry, joined the White Army to fight Trotsky's Red Army. But despite his son's fight against the Bolsheviks, Sergei Prakuzin Gorsky enjoyed the support of the communist authorities. He was even offered a professorship at the new Institute for Photography by the Bolshevik Commissar for Culture, Anatoly Lunacharsky. In this archive film, Lunacharsky explains the meaning of art to the proletariat masses. He was keen to involve the old world professionals like Prakuzin Gorsky in the development of revolutionary art. But Prakuzin Gorsky was not persuaded. In 1918, soon after the murder of the royal family, he left Russia. Well, I think that my grandfather decided to move for personal reason, you have the feeling that it will be very difficult to pursue his technical work in a condition when you are under revolution or civil war. And maybe something much more romantic that uh, he maybe take this opportunity to link with his mistress who will be my grandmother. Prakuzin Gorsky managed to leave Russia with most of his archive and his mistress, who was 22 years younger. His first family joined him in Paris several years later, and once everything was settled, he was able to carry on with his work. He was focused uh, not really on the family, he was focused on his work. He was uh, really passionate for the color photography and for this idea that image in color is something completely magic and uh, completely fantastic. Michel Susseline, the grandson of Sergei prokudin Gorsky, was talking to Dina Newman. The pioneering photographer died in Paris in 1944, and the full collection of those colour photos was sold by the family to the US Library of Congress. But if you go online to BBC Witness Films, you can see some of the most striking of those images, along with a commentary by Michel Susseline. So, what of the Russian revolutions of 1917, beginning with the abdication of Tsar Nicholas II, a hundred years ago this month. Joining me now is the BBC's Moscow correspondent, Sarah Rainsford. So, Sarah, to what extent have um, Russians remained somewhat misty-eyed about the Tsars? I think not very misty-eyed, probably, is is fair to say. Uh, There was one mini-scandal this week when the man who leads Crimea, the annexed area of Ukraine that Russia took over three years ago, he called for the restoration of the monarchy. He said Russia didn't need to be a democracy, and he thought that, uh, in fact, Russia needed a dictatorship, but he specifically wanted a monarchy. Now, we talked to the president's spokesman here in Moscow about that, and he said that wasn't something that President Putin thought was a good idea. The thing with Russia today is that, essentially, in the figure of Vladimir Putin, there is 
a czar, a modern day czar, a very different kind of figure. But there are a lot of the parts and pieces of royalty that go with the way he rules. So in a way, there's no need to be misty eyed for the days of, of the Romanov's rules when you have Vladimir Putin in the Kremlin. If you're looking for a strong leader, well, then he's that. If you're looking for someone who was almost anointed and appointed without really normal democratic process, then you've got that in Vladimir Putin too. And a lot of people are pretty happy with that. So looking back 100 years, how schizophrenic are Russians today about commemorating those events of 1917, the revolutions? Because as you say, we've almost come full circle circle with the collapse of communism and the rise of the new uber-rich elite in Russia and uh, a a czar-like figure in Putin. Well, you know, I think what's interesting is how little commemoration, uh, marking at all of the revolution that there is here in Russia. I mean, if you look at newspapers in English from around the world, you see all sorts of exhibitions and events that are taking place. In Russia, that's just not the case. There are events, there are things happening. But for example, watch state television here in Russia, which is massively influential, and you'll barely hear anything about the fact that this is the centenary year of the revolution. There was very, very little about the abdication anniversary of the czars this week. And I think the problem is that Russia doesn't quite know how to deal with the idea of revolution because it's what President Putin is absolutely terrified of and it's what he's gone out of his way to ensure won't happen here in Russia. And so celebrating or commemorating a revolution like 1917 is extremely problematic for the current regime, if you like, uh, here in, in Russia. And so essentially they're trying to ignore it on, on the, in the big picture. So I looked at the TV listings over this week to see if there was anything uh, in terms of, of documentaries and so on. There was just one documentary about the abdication anniversary and that was after midnight uh, on the day of the anniversary. So it's just not there on a big scale. It's not really featuring in people's consciousness here. And yet, and yet you can't really avoid it if you walk through the middle of Moscow because Lenin, who was at the forefront of the October Revolution, he's still lying there in state. He is, and people still go to see him, uh, and not just visitors, foreigners who come here, uh, but Russians too. Uh, Yes, he's still there. There is often, and and I think this year it happened again, there is a debate about whether or not he should finally be buried, but it's an ongoing debate, and I think, again, it's a a hugely problematic thing when you're trying to pretend the revolution didn't happen uh, to have Lenin lying there, but also extremely problematic to sort of pop him out of the mausoleum and, and into a hole in the ground. Is there in Russia today anything that you would call... Um, class consciousness in the in the old sense and in the sense that was brought to life really by those remarkable colour photos of the, the years before the revolution in 1917 of the way in which different people lived different lives in Russia of those times. Is there still class consciousness and are there any communists left? Well, there are definitely communists left, yes. Uh, they're the second party in Parliament. That doesn't make them a particularly big party in Parliament because, of course, the, the pro-Kremlin party is the one that dominates and the Parliament itself is, is pretty toothless these days. But the communists are, are, are a force and the man who has led the party for a couple of decades now, Gennady Zuganov, is still the leader and he's probably going to run for president next year against Vladimir Putin. Of course, he, he will come a very distant second or third place, perhaps, if he does run. Interestingly, the communists on a local level have developed into something of a real opposition force against the pro-Kremlin party, which is generally in power in those places. But also, I think for most people, they're associated very much with the past. And generally, their supporters tend to be the old men and women who occasionally troop out with their red flags and uh, mark old Soviet holidays. Sarah Rainsford in Moscow. And let me remind 